Hi, everybody. My name is Dave Vellante. Welcome back to our wall-to-wall coverage of AWS reInvent 2024. Uh, this is actually my first day of covering. John Furrier has been <laughs> holding down the fort, and we're really super excited to have Jan Gilg here. He's the president and chief product officer of Cloud ERP at SAP. Welcome to theCUBE. Welcome from Germany to Las Vegas and reInvent. Big show. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, you bet. Uh, so th tell us a little bit about the, the role and the focus on, on Cloud ERP. Yeah, so I'm uh, responsible at SAP uh, for our cloud ERP uh, product portfolio, I would say. Um, front and center is our flagship ERP solution that is S4HANA uh, public cloud, as we as we call it. Uh, but we do have a lot of complementary solutions there as well from the finance domain, but also from the supply chain domain, some industry specific solutions and so on. And uh, we are offering um, our ERP solution in two uh, options, basically. One is a private deployment. The other one is a true SaaS solution. Uh, our go-to-market uh, motion is called Grow, Grow with SAP. So we're really addressing uh, fast-growing companies with that SaaS ERP solution, and now we made it available on the AWS marketplace. So I want to get into some of the opportunities that you guys have because, mm -hmm. of course, uh, SAP touches so many different types of businesses and parts of the business and different use cases. And, and when we talk about the possibility of AI and agents, and it just opens up a whole new vector of growth for, for firms like yours that have done you know, so much of the hard work and the plumbing, if I can call it that, over the years. And so, well, we maybe have time to talk about that, but uh, but on day two, I think it was on Tuesday, you announced this yes. this Grow. Uh, it's So SAP and AWS announced Grow um, uh, uh, with SAP on AWS. What exactly was announced? So basically, uh, we are taking our um, ERP solution, our SaaS ERP solution, which is s Public Cloud, um, and basically make it available uh, for purchase on the AWS marketplace. Uh, as you can imagine, an ERP solution is not something uh, necessarily that you just buy and then activate. So it is a, a private listing, so to speak. You can you can find it, but then you basically can uh, request um, to get more information on the on the product. And those requests they uh, go directly to our partners because we do have a pretty substantial set of partners that are um, grow partners for us, but they are also AWS partners. So they will then receive basically the lead, if you will, and then they work. Uh, with the customer, uh, show the product, you know, do demos, explain uh, everything, and then once the customer decides to buy it, that happens then actually through the AWS marketplace, and the solution gets deployed uh, on top of AWS uh, infrastructure. Is the is the complexity that there is specialized infrastructure that has to be created, or is it just the nature of ERP that you have to really? map it to your business and your yeah. business process that's obviously not trivial yes yeah. so it's it's the latter because the, the first one of course in the, in the SaaS world we we made it much much easier and aws is is helping here uh, tremendously right to uh, remove some of the the technical barriers it's all managed by us actually on top of aws infrastructure but it's really what you said uh, in terms of the inherent complexity of erp so you have to have uh, you have to map it to business process as you said uh, we ship actually what we call best, press, uh, best practice processes already out of the box with the solution where we say, hey, over the last 50 years, we've done uh, quite a few uh, ERP implementations uh, with customers. And based on that, we know how standard processes typically work. And that's what we ship with the product. So it can be up and running rather quickly. And then the customer can actually adjust uh, to their own needs. So I'm interested in what the conversations with customers are like around moving their ERP to cloud because you know, a lot of the, the mission-critical workloads have not moved yeah. to the cloud because there's risk and it's complicated and people say, hey, it's working mm -hmm. and we're making a lot of money on these, so don't mess with it. But <laughs> but at the same time, you know, they don't want to keep investing, you know, the whole undifferentiated heavy lifting narrative that AWS puts forth. So w when customers talk to you about moving to the cloud, why cloud ERP? What, what do they get out of it? Yeah, I think first and foremost, um, they do get access uh, to innovation, right? And what we have seen in the in the past, and, and you know, as a company, we come from an on-premise world where, where customers yep. basically install the ERP solution and then they're fully in charge for it. But we have seen customers struggle with upgrading, right? So therefore, they fall back, they're sitting on all the releases, and with that, they have no possibility to consume any innovation uh, that we are shipping as part of our uh, regular innovation updates that we provide like any other uh, SaaS company. 
Uh, and that is actually, from my perspective, one of the key drivers. The other one, of course, is, is cost. Yeah? So really um, uh, reducing then cost of, of running and managing an ERP uh, solution, which can be uh, quite costly, especially when we talk about larger customers. So that's another big uh, motivation. And the third one, I would say, is really agility. Yeah? Because what we are seeing is that there is a lot of change out there and industries change, requirements change, and customers have to adjust all the time. A, a traditional on-premise ERP system is not necessarily very nimble and adjustable, so it usually takes a lot of time to change processes, activate them, then bring them into production, and that is much, much easier in the cloud, especially if you follow uh, those best practice processes that I mentioned before. So on the first uh, item that you mentioned, the upgrades, so you r do a new release, mm -hmm. it's got all this great new function in it, Yes. Um, and it's like my iPhone. I don't want to download the new <laughs> iOS. I'm like, no, not yet, not yet. Uh, you know, and, and, and so, at so some I don't. Point you have to. <laughs> at some point, I have to. They're going to force me, and, and, and it's the same. But, the same. But, but, and then, and then, but there's also, in the back of my mind, a security angle mm -hmm. here because if I'm not the latest and greatest, because there's always some kind of security patching going on, and so you want to keep up to date on that. So you're saying, on the on the on the cloud ERP. That just happens. Yes, automatically. exactly. Yeah. So the security updates anyway, uh, they happen all the time, uh, especially in the cloud. Obviously, we do this right. constantly. Uh, and then on the functional level, yeah, where you talk about features and functions, that is then something as well that we uh, bring to our customers. To your point, um, it's always then the question, how much can customers consume? How much do they like those upgrades? So we give a certain flexibility, but at the end of the day, yes, they have to consume it, if you will. Or you could say they can consume it because that gives them always uh, new possibilities, actually, on how to how to optimize some of the business outcomes. Yeah, customers plan for that, too. They yeah. know when they sign up exactly. that, that this is part of the deal. Um, what is Juul? Tell me more about Juul. Yeah. What's that all about? So Juul is really our digital assistant, uh, our digital AI assistant, if you will, uh, that comes as part of um, anything you buy from, uh, from SAP. So if you buy an application from SAP, uh, Juul is um, deployed with the application. By the way, the same for Grow, right? So if a customer buys now Grow on AWS Marketplace, uh, Juul will come with Grow, and that will, from my perspective, become really over time the primary interface for many, many end users to really ask um, the assistant uh, questions in natural language. And the assistant can then basically, you know, pull in data, can look up data inside of the ERP solution, can bring up purchase orders, sales orders, and you can do certain things like, um, you know, move, remove restrictions, uh, change order quantities or whatever it is. And you do all this inside of Juul and then send it back uh, to the underlying uh, ERP solution. And uh, you mentioned AI earlier. Obviously, what we are working on now is the next evolution is really um, to provide agents as part of the uh, Juul framework. So those agents then take on a lot of the workload that otherwise the uh, end user would have to do um, and go into multiple uh, applications inside of the ERP solution. Um, Juul and the agents behind it, they uh, take care uh, of a bunch of those tasks then uh, going forward in, a, in an automated way. Okay, I'm glad you brought this up. So, okay, so Jewel, you called it a digital assistant. You didn't call it an agent, but it's setting up the agent yes, framework. Exactly. Okay, so uh, uh, so first of all, thank you, because there's a lot of agent washing going on. Yes. A lot of people <laughs> are talking, about, oh, agent this, and most of them are just like single co-pilots or very rudimentary, yeah. or essentially digital assistants that you can talk to and just do some stuff. Yes. But they're not what we think of as agentic. Yeah. And, and agentic, everybody throws that term around, but it's a, it's a, it's a very a complicated situation yeah. to actually have agents you know do what humans do and do so with with governed you know processes and and step by step and doing so accurately and so I think you you very well understand this. Having said that, is a massive opportunity. So when you think about the potential for automation and all the workflows that we have automated a lot of workflows with SaaS and and commercial off the shelf software and of course there's custom mods. Yeah. But there's so much more that's yeah. non-automated, and yeah. that's really where Agentic comes in, but it's not easy. And so I wonder if you could give us your point of view and yeah. give us a little roadmap. I think you're absolutely spot on, and we have been talking about uh, automation uh, in the ERP context since, since the inception, right? right, back in the 90s. Yeah. Uh, but still, uh, when I see customers, a lot of those processes, they are not, not really automated, um, barely digital, uh, and certainly not fully automated. So I think um, AI will help significantly here in many ways huh? um, by taking out certain process steps or automate uh, certain things so you don't have to go in manually and do something in the system. 
um, because the data is actually available uh, and the system becomes more intelligent and understands what an end user uh, tries to accomplish or tries to achieve and, and becomes much more proactive so it can make uh, suggestions. In Jewel, as, as you said, uh, when we talk about agents there, it's really um, more something like a dispute management uh, case. You know? So somebody uh, sends an email and says, I do have um, a problem with my invoice. I don't think it's correct. Yeah? And if you think about what that triggers typically in a company, yeah? somebody has to then look up, okay, who's this customer? Uh, what are the, what is the invoice he's referring to? Um, pull this up, then do an investigation. Why is this wrong? Is it wrong? Then maybe I then issue a credit note. Can I do that? What's the company policy on this? So there's many, many steps um, that uh, exist. Yes, they are digital, but they're not automated. It's all happening manual. You have to collaborate and so on. And that's where I believe um, agents will um, do a lot of uh, this heavy lifting. Um, and it is complex. Yeah? So you have multiple agents. Everyone is specialized on a certain discipline. They do the handovers of the task. Yeah? And as a as a framework, then eventually uh, come back to the um, um, end user and say, hey, by the way, so your customer sent uh, this, this uh, email to us. We, we checked everything and we would recommend uh, you know, to issue a credit note. Should I do it for you? So they have done everything in the background already. And the end user at the end of the day just has to decide yes or no. And of course, they can check then you know, what has happened, what were the steps that those agents uh, went through. Uh, that's, in my mind, really where the, the true power comes in that lies behind uh, Jewel as the digital assistant, which is more of the, the front end. Then, yeah. In those steps, they, there, there may be many, many dozens or even hundreds yeah. sometimes. So what you're talking about now is, I think, critical to understanding, at least beginning to understand the whole agentic conversation. Uh, because what you just described is what I would call exception handling. So the agent has some job to do, and the agent can do it very well as long as it's within whatever yeah. you know steps that have been established. But then there's this exception, and then I think what you're describing is that the the agent over time will get smarter yes. by learning from the reasoning traces of the human, observing what the humans have done to resolve that that exception, yeah. and then the next time it comes through, the agents will handle it. That is like nirvana, and it's tricky to do. And uh, keep in mind, I think where we have really a benefit at SAP, we have 10,000s of customers uh, that run the ERP system in the cloud and we have access to this data. So customers give us consent that we can use this data in a uh, automated way. Um, and that's over 33,000 customers that have done that already, right? So this is the data pool we have access to. And then of course, you can identify through AI all those patterns yeah? and then also extract basically uh, the best possible path, so to speak, and bring that back. And I think that's one of the big benefits in the cloud as well. If you look only into the data that you have as a customer in your single system, it's very limited. Yeah? Uh, also in terms of the insights that you can drive. But if you expand this lens and say, hey, now I have access to 33,000 customers, they all run similar processes and I can really be pretty clear on, on what is the best practice and how ideally this should be handled, that is very, very powerful. So there's a couple of things that have to happen, and I would love to get your perspective on this as a leader in this, this complicated business. You've got to have the data, the data has to be harmonized in a way so that such that, I always use the example, revenue means revenue. It doesn't mean <laughs> NRR, or ARR, or quarterly revenue, or annual revenue, or fiscal year. And uh, we sit around and debate in a meeting. What are we, where did this data come from? Okay, <laughs> so it has to be harmonized. Um, it, it, there also has to be a governance framework. Uh, we call it, you know, the agentic, uh, uh, the agent control framework, yes. if you will. And so these are sort of new pieces of the the stack. You also have to be able to think not just in terms of data, but also processes. You have to be able to encapsulate those processes. And so I'm curious as to how, like, first of all, is that sort of a right way to think about it? And how does AWS fit in? They just announced this like wonderful stuff around new and improved SageMaker and, and Bedrock is heavily embedded. So I, with all those wonderful you know, model gardens, so that's going to play a role here. So yeah. help us understand all that uh, complexity, if you would. Yeah, so I think uh, it starts with business process, as you said, and um, the advantage is that we are shipping now um, best practice processes to our customers. And we say, as long as you uh, stick with those processes, you have, of course, advantages because we believe those are the most efficient ways of doing things in a, in a company. Uh, those processes then generate the data, you know, and to your point, and I, SAP has a very comprehensive uh, data model along very long end-to-end -end processes. And we have a broad set of, of applications as well. So those processes often they spend multiple applications, but we know the semantics of that model, which is, which is really, really powerful. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we can then also 
help customers uh, clean up and harmonize their data. And uh, we basically provide uh, the underlying data uh, platform on which this data can be can be um, uh, stored, and so to speak. And now we are building the AI on top, and there's different ways uh, of doing this. One is, um, you know, through through Jewel, where we um, de develop use cases ourselves and leverage the agentic framework that's in there uh, and build use cases that we ship to the customer. Customer has also the possibility to do this themselves. And we offer a technology, it's called uh, the Gen AI Hub. Uh, it's on top of our uh, technology platform, business technology platform that, by the way, also runs on AWS. And then customers can actually tap into uh, any large language model that's, uh, that's out there. Because our strategy is to be really agnostic to the large language model providers. And to create the link now to AWS and also the announcements around Nova, we are basically a day zero partner now to also provide access to Nova uh, directly to our customers. So already today, they can actually now build AI cases leveraging uh, Nova and extend then certain capabilities of uh, our ERP solution. And what we will do then over time, my developers, so to speak, when they build use cases inside of Jewel, and th they can also tap into uh, the Nova model. The customer doesn't know that, of course, eh, because they don't necessarily care what model is being called in the background. But for us, it's another very powerful opportunity now to tap into uh, the innovation that AWS provides. Okay, so I can tap uh, uh, in cloud ERP. I can tap all those wonderful innovations that yes. uh, that that AWS provides, and as they innovate, I can you, you know tap those as well. Yes, yeah. Exactly. And, yeah. and this is uh, this this is exciting because it's all about business transformation. Eric Brynjolfsson, who's a former MIT professor, now he's at Stanford. He draws the power law of automation. Yeah. This is what we talked about. So much of the, uh, of of our work is non automated. Yes, and this is how we get to you know 10x in the future. But it's going to take a while. It doesn't happen overnight. And and it is a transformational effort. And I think for a long time ERP has been looked at very technical, and, and upgrades have been looked at very technical, and even moving it to the cloud. If you only look into um, yeah, I, instead of running it on my own hardware, I now run it on a hyperscaler. You have certainly already uh, advantages but you haven't done really a transformation to the way you work and to the way you run your processes. And I think that really comes then when you start um, you know, looking into your business processes, look into business process re-engineering, look into standardization where it's commodity, and then think about where do I differentiate as a company? What's my secret sauce? And how can I actually then extend the standard software um, to bring out that secret sauce? And that is where there's so much possibility nowadays uh, with um, you know the technology available based on AI, the large language models, and so on. So that has changed fundamentally compared to even 10 years ago. Right, and and LLMs are so cool, they're amazing, but they're you know, trained basically on public data or sometimes private data, but they don't have, hopefully they don't have my data, no. my, my enterprise, <laughs> and that's where you guys come in. Exactly. So much uh, great, exciting opportunity, Jan. Thanks so much for coming to theCUBE, really appreciate having you. Yeah, thanks so much. Good luck with the launch. Yeah. All right, and, and keep it right there, more action from AWS reInvent 2024 from Las Vegas. My name is Dave Vellante, John Furrier's here. We're right back right after this short break.